Hello dear students, welcome to the botany class. In the previous video, we had discussed about the types and agents of pollination. And today, let us move on to the next topic that is contrivances for pollination. Now, what is the meaning of contrivances? Contrivances means devices or tools. So, contrivances for pollination means these are the devices or the tools which encourage the cross-pollination. So, once again I will repeat, contrivances are nothing but the tools which encourages the cross-pollination. And there are different kinds of contrivances for cross-pollination. They are declining, dichogamy, self-sterility, heterostyly and hercogamy. These are the Types of contrivances which encourages the cross-pollination. Coming to the first type that is declining or it is also called as unisexuality. In this condition, the flower is always unisexual. Unisexual means the flower contain either stamen or the carpel. Stamen is nothing but the male reproductive organ of the flower, whereas carpel is the female reproductive organ of the flower. So, in unisexual flower, the flower contains either stamen or carpel. If stamen is present, then that flower is called as staminate flower. So, staminate means male flower. Or if the uh, carpels are present in the flower, then that flower is called as pistillate. So, staminate means it is a male flower. Pistillate means it is the female flower. Is that clear? Okay. Unisexuality can be of two types. They are monoecious plant and dioecious plant. Now, what is the meaning of monoecious? When both male and female flowers are born on the same plant, the plant is called as monoecious. So, monoecious means here, on the same plant, it contains the male and the female flowers. Whereas dioecious plant means when male and female flowers are born on the different plants, it is called as dioecious. That means in dioecious plant, here the male and the female flowers are born on the different plants. So monoecious means here male and female flowers are born on the same plant. And in dioecious, the male and the female flowers are born on the different plants. For monoecious, examples are maize, cucumber, etc. And for dioecious, it is papaya. So, in this slide, you can see the images of uh, uh, pistillate and staminate flowers of cucumber and the maize plant. So, the pistillate flower is nothing but the female flower and the staminate means male flower. These two flowers of the cucumber are produced in the same plant. Hence, the plant is here monoecious. And in maize also, here you can see the tassel part. So, tassel is nothing but the male flower of maize. So, tassel is the male flower or the male inflorescence where it contains the male flowers. Whereas, silk means it is the female flower. Okay. So, tassel is the male flower and silk is the female flower. And these two flowers are born on the same plant. Hence, the condition is monoecious. Is that clear? So, for monoecious, we have two examples here. Cucumber and maize. And for dioecious, the example is papaya. So, this is the male papaya plant where you can see the male flowers. And this is the female plant of papaya where you can see the fruits. Okay. And these two flowers, male and female flowers of the papaya are produced in two different plants. Hence, the condition is dioecious. 
and this is about the first contrivance first uh, device which encourages the cross pollination that is declining condition understood now we'll move on to the second type that is dichogamy so dichogamy in this condition the flower is always bisexual what do you mean by bisexual bisexual means here a single flower contains both male and female reproductive organs that means both male and female reproductive organs are produced in a same flower okay so that condition is called as bisexual but the maturation time the maturation time of the uh, sex organs are different here that means in this bisexual flower the maturation time of these two sexes are different they mature at different intervals so such condition is called as dichogamy so if in the flower stamen matures first than the stigma then the condition is called as protandry and the flower is said to be protandrous flower once again i'll repeat when stamens mature earlier than the stigma then the flower then the condition is called as protandry and the flower is called as protandrous examples for protandrous conditions jasmine sunflower etc but in uh, some uh, flowers stigma matures first than the stamens then that condition is called as protogyny and the flower is said to be protogynous example for this rose so protandrous means or proto protandry means here the stamens mature first whereas protogyny means here stigma matures first so this is about the dichogamy condition and uh, this is the image of uh, protandry and protogyny condition of uh, flowers okay moving on to the next condition which encourages the cross pollination is self sterility or it is also called as self incompatibility which means the pollen grain of one flower cannot fertilize the ovules of the same flower once again i'll repeat the pollen grains of one flower cannot fertilize the ovules of the same flower then that flower is called as self sterile or incompatible and the condition of the flower is called as self sterility or intra specific incompatibility or self incompatibility an example for this condition is tobacco and other examples are potato apple etc so self sterility means here the pollen grains of one flower cannot fertilizes the ovules of the same flower and in these flowers cross pollination is the only means for fertilization and production of seeds so this is the image of self incompatibility in relation to its genotype in tobacco now this is the pistil part of the flower this is the pistil part which is of uh, s1 and s2 type the pistil it is of s1 and s2 type now this pistil of s1 and s2 type when it receives the pollen grains of different types say for example s3 and s4 when the s1 and s2 type of uh, pistil receives the pollen grains of s3 and s4 types this pistil it accept the pollen grains and it allows the pollen grains to germinate on the stigmatic surface because here pollen grains are coming from the different flowers but in this case you can observe that the pistil contains s3 and s1 type of pollen grains but this pistil allows the s3 type of pollen grain to germinate on its surface 
but it rejects the S1 type of pollen grain. Because S1 type of pollen grain, it comes from the same flower. Okay, and here also you can observe that S1 and S2 type of uh, pistil rejects the S2 and S1 type of uh, pollen grains because these pollen grains are coming from the same flower. So, this is called as self sterility or self incompatibility. Am I clear? So, this is about the third type of uh, uh, contrivance which encourages the cross pollination. Moving on to the next type that is heterostyly. Here, the plants are dimorphic. In some species, the plants are dimorphic. Dimorphic means uh, it contains two types of flowers. Some of the plant possess a long style but short stamens and are called pin-eyed while others uh, have short style and long stamens. These are called as thrum-eyed. So, in heterostylous condition, the plants of uh, some species possess two types of flowers. Hence, it is called as dimorphic. In dimorphic flower, some of the flower possess long style but short stamens and are known as pin-eyed. Whereas in some other, the style is short whereas the stamens are long and this uh, type is called as thrum-eyed. An example for heterostylous condition is oxalis. So, in the picture you can observe that uh, there is a long style and short style uh, uh, flowers. A long style flower is called as pin-eyed flower and a short style flower is called as thrum-eyed flowers. And next contrivance is hercogamy. In some bisexual flowers where the stigma and anthers mature at the same time, self-pollination is avoided by some sort of barrier. Once again I will repeat, in some bisexual flower where the stigma and anthers mature at the same time, if, uh, if uh, both the sex organ mature at the same time, what happens? Uh, pollination takes place here. Okay, self-pollination takes place here. But in hercogamy condition, there are some sort of barrier which avoid the self-pollination in such flowers. And uh, these flowers show following contrivances to encourage the cross-pollination. Some of them are as follows. The male and the female sex organs lie at some distance from each other. In some flowers, corolla has peculiar forms which act as barrier in self-pollination. In some other flowers, the pollens are held together to form pollinia which can only be carried away by the insects. For example, in Calotropis, in Calotropis, uh, here the pollen grains are produced uh, or pollen grains are produced in a bag like structure called pollinia and these pollinia are carried by the insects only okay and examples for uh, hercogamy condition is gloriosa superba so in this uh, picture this is the picture of a uh, gloriosa superba so here you can uh, observe the stamens so, these are the stamens of uh, this flowers. These are the stamens and here also one stamen is present. And this is the stigma part or the pistil part of the female, I mean uh, gloriosa superba. So, this is about the hercogamy condition. Next, we will move on to the new topic. So, these are all about the contrivances for cross pollination. Next, we will move on to the new topic that is structure of a flower. A typical flower consists of four parts. They are sepal, petal, stamen and carpel. Of these four parts, 
the sepal and the petals are referred as accessory organs or non essential organs whereas stamen and carpels are referred as reproductive organs so sepal and petals are referred as accessory organs whereas stamen and carpels are referred as reproductive organs so these are the four parts of a typical flower coming to the first reproductive organ that is stamen and this stamen is also called as androecium and in flower stamen is considered as the male reproductive organ so stamen is the male reproductive organ of the flower and each stamen consists of three parts they are filament connective and anther these three are the parts of a stamen filament connective and anther now this portion of the stamen is the filament so filament is nothing but a long stalk like part and at the tip this filament contains the anther once again i'll repeat filament is nothing but the long stalk of the stamen and at the tip this filament contains anther now what is the meaning of connective so connective is nothing but it is a part of the uh, stamen which connects the anther and the filaments so now this is the connective portion so this greenish part is the connective portion which connects the uh, filament to the anther so in this way there are three parts in a stamen they are filament connective and anther and inside the anther uh, pollen grains are produced so inside the anther pollen grains are produced is that clear now the anther anther is nothing but the tip part of the stamen where the pollen grains are produced now this anther may be monothicous or dithicous what is the meaning of monothicous and dithicous so if the anther contains single lobe now this is a single lobed anther if it contains a single lobe then it is called as monothicous so if the anther contains two lobes then it is called as dithicous once again i'll repeat monothicous anther means it contains single lobe whereas dithicous anther means it contains two lobes okay now when we take the transfer section of these anthers each anther lobe inside it contains a single chamber okay each anther contains sorry each anther contains two chambers and these chambers are called as locules or pollen sacs or microsporangia once again i'll repeat each lobe of the anther contains two chambers and these chambers are called as locules or microsporangia or pollen sacs okay so a monothicous anther it contains a single lobe right so when we take the section of this monothicous anther we can see two chambers within that anther lobe hence this monothicous anther is called as bisporangiate anther bisporangiate anther why it is called as bisporangiate because in the section we can observe two chambers whereas in a dithicus anther if we take the section we can observe four chambers because this dithicus anther it is a two lobed structure and each lobe contains two chambers so that two lobes contains four chambers so in this way a dithicus anther contains four chambers and because of that a dithicus anther is also referred as tetralocular or tetrasporangiate anther 
once again I'll repeat. The anther may be of two types, monothicus and dipicus. Monothicus anther means it contains single lobe, whereas dipicus anther means it contains two lobes. So when we take the section of the anther lobe, we can see two chambers in a single lobe. Okay. So when we take the section of the monothicus anther, we can observe only two chambers because it contains only one lobe and because of that the monothicus anther is also called as bilocular or bisporangiate anther whereas dithicus anther it contains two lobes right and in these two lobes it produces four chambers and because of the four chambers the dithicus anther is called as tetralocular or tetrasporangiate anther is that clear okay now coming to the structure of microsporangium what is microsporangium so microsporangium is nothing but it is the chamber of the anther lobe so in the previous slide uh, we had discussed about the uh, locules or the uh, pollen sacs so these pollen sacs are also called as microsporangia okay so a typical microsporangium is nearly circular in outline and it is surrounded by four wall layers they are epidermis endothecium middle layers and tapetum so these are the four wall layers of the microsporangium so in the picture you can see um, the stamen structure and this is the anther part of the stamen so when we take the section of this anther this is a dithicus anther we can observe the chambers here there are four chambers and these chambers are called as the microsporangia microsporangium singular microsporangia plural now in the microsporangia it contains four wall layers they are epidermis endothecium middle layers and tapetum these are the four wall layers now the outermost wall layer is the epidermis it is a single layered structure this is the outermost wall layer of the microsporangium and next to the microsporan next to the epidermis endothecium is present and next to the endothecium middle layers are present and next to the middle layers tapetum is present so tapetum also it is a single layered structure so in this way there are four wall layers are present in a microsporangium understood okay now of these four layers the first three layers means epidermis endothecium and the uh, middle layer give protection and help in dehiscence of the anther to release the pollen whereas the innermost layer called tapetum it nourishes the developing pollen grains okay so this is the picture of the microsporangium where you can observe the parts epidermis endothecium middle layer and tapetum so of these four layers the first three layers means epidermis endothecium and the middle layer give protection and help in dehiscence of the anther to release the pollen grains whereas the innermost uh, wall layer which is called as the tapetum it is a single layered structure it gives nourishment to the developing pollen grains okay now in the young anther each uh, microsporangium it has a group of tissue at the center next to the tapetum so now uh, in the picture this is the tapetum portion right now in each 
microsporangium next to the tapetum it contains a mass of tissue a group of tissue so this tissue is called as sporogenous tissue so sporogenous tissue is nothing but it is a mass of tissue present at the center of the microsporangium is that clear now this sporogenous tissue it contains compactly arranged diploid cells each sporogenous tissue it contains compactly arranged diploid cells and these cells are called as sporogenous cells the cells the cells in the sporogenous tissue is called as sporogenous cells am i clear okay now next what happens now as the anther develops each of this sporogenous cell sporogenous cell is nothing but the a cell of the sporogenous tissue now as the anther matures what happens is this each sporogenous cell which is diploid in nature and this sporogenous cell is also called as microspore mother cell or pollen mother cell which undergoes meiotic division to form microspores so each sporogenous cell or each microspore mother cell undergoes meiosis to form four microspores and these microspores are arranged in a form of a tetrad tetrad means cluster of four cells hence it is called as microspore tetrads so from each uh, microspore mother cell microspore tetrads are formed okay and the process of formation of microspores from pollen mother cell through meiosis is called as microsporogenesis once again i'll repeat the process of formation of microspores from pollen mother cell or microspore mother cell through meiosis is called as microsporogenesis is that clear so this sporogenous cell it is the cell of the sporogenous tissue and this cell is diploid in nature and when it undergoes meiosis it produces four microspores and all these four microspores are arranged in a cluster hence it is called as microspore tetrad now the formation of the microspore tetrads from the pollen mother cell through meiosis is called as microsporogenesis is that clear so after microsporogenesis from sporogenous cells many microspore tetrads are formed is that clear okay so this is the uh, diagrammatic representation of microsporogenesis so here this is a single pollen mother cell or microspore mother cell which is diploid and this pollen mother cell it is a unicellular structure which undergoes meiosis as a result of this a uh, cluster of four cells are formed this cluster is nothing but the microspore tetrad now after the maturation at the time of dehiscence these cells separate from each other and released into the external environment okay next move on to the structure of male gametophyte here what happens is after a microsporogenesis from pollen mother cell microspores are formed now these microspores are also called as pollen grains okay the microspores are also called as pollen grains and this pollen grain carries the male gametes once again i'll repeat the pollen grain carries the male gametes hence it is called as male gametophyte so male gametophyte is nothing but the pollen grain let's move on to the structure of pollen grain a pollen grain it is nearly spherical in outline and it measures about 25 to 50 mm in diameter 
and each pollen grain has a two layer structure they are the outer layer that is exine and the inner layer is intine so once again i'll repeat this pollen grain it is also called as male gametophyte and it measures about 25 to 50 mm in diameter it is nearly spherical in outline and has two layers exine and intine now exine it is the outer layer which is thick and is made up of sporopollenin sporopollenin is the wall material present in the exine of the pollen grain and it can withstand high temperature and strong acids and alkali and each exine has apertures or each exine has narrow areas at some places where the sporopollenin is absent and these areas are called as germ pores once again i'll repeat in the exine region of the uh, pollen grain at some places sporopollenin is absent and this area is called as germ pores and the intine it is the innermost layer and it is thin and made up of cellulose and pectin and next to the wall layers i mean next to the intine layer cytoplasm is present which is surrounded by the plasma membrane and a matured pollen grain contains two cells they are vegetative cell with vegetative nucleus and generative cell with generative nucleus so this is the vegetative cell and this is the generative cell so in mature pollen grain we can observe two cells so vegetative cell it is slightly bigger so this is the vegetative cell it is slightly bigger and it contains um, reserve food materials plenty of reserve food materials are present in the vegetative cell along with the food materials it contains a large irregularly shaped nucleus whereas the generative cell it is smaller and it floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell and it is spindle shaped with the dense cytoplasm and a single nucleus is that clear so in pollen grain in mature pollen grain there are two cells vegetative cell which is bigger and contains plenty of uh, reserve food materials along with the single irregularly shaped nucleus whereas the generative cell it is small and it is spindle shaped and it floats in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell and it also contains a nucleus single nucleus over 60% angiosperms shed their pollen grains at two celled stage in others generative cell divides mitotically to give two male gametes thus pollen grains are shed at the three cell stage now what happens after the formation of vegetative cell and vege uh, generative cell now this vegetative cell contains its own nucleus that is vegetative nucleus and the generative cell also contains its own generative nucleus now after the formation of these nucleus again the generative nucleus divides to form two more nuclei and these two nuclei later on develops into the male gametes so in this way a single pollen grain carries two male gametes with a single vegetative nucleus and this vegetative nucleus is also called as tube nucleus is that clear so that is about the topic thank you